Well, thank you for joining me. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about something that has been uh, a keen interest of mine for over a decade. And that's the topic of meteors and meteorites, what we commonly think of as falling stars. It's really important that we understand that those of us working in science, in Western science, non-Indigenous people, Indigenous knowledge doesn't need to be validated by Western science. It's not there to be validated by Western science. Um, it's already valid in its own right. There are going to be areas where the indigenous knowledge and the Western science meld in perfectly. There are going to be areas where it doesn't meld in perfectly. And there are going to be areas where they might almost seem in conflict. So what? It's about having two different systems of knowledge that try to understand the world in quite different ways. And each have their benefits. Yes, yeah, so I'm Tyson Yanko Porter. Um, yeah, I belong to Uplich Clan on, on Western Cape York. Of um, previous older affiliations in South Australia and um, uh, into the southeast, uh, I work as a senior lecturer in Indigenous knowledges at um, Deakin University, and yeah, father, uncle, grandfather, cousin, brother, everything, uh, all of these roles you know that we fulfil. You know that they're sitting in a in a universe, a, a dynamic universe that's. Um, it's dynamic because of the diversity of it. So, you know, when, you, um, when you're when you looking at the reflection of the moon on the ocean at night, you know, you're seeing from that subjective standpoint, you know, you're seeing that reflection right there. Um, but that's not where it is, you know, because as you're moving along that beach, you see that that's moving as well. And so you've got to understand that from all the eyes looking, you know, it's uh, seeing those, that, that moon reflection in a different place. What are falling stars? What are some of the science behind it? Really giant chunks of rock in space are called asteroids. They're generally about 10 meters or bigger in size, from 10 meters to even a couple of hundred kilometers in size. If it's smaller than 10 meters and it's in outer space, we call it a meteoroid. Most meteoroids are the size of a grain of sand or, or less than that. They travel through space at very high velocities, anywhere from 15 to 20, 25 kilometers a second. That's how fast they're going. When they come into the atmosphere, they start to burn up. They burn up by something called ram pressure. They're traveling at these tremendous speeds and coming into the Earth's thick atmosphere, and it creates pressure. And this pressure creates heat and causes them to burn up. When they burn up, we see a flash of light across the sky like we can see in our image. This is called a meteor. Most meteors burn up in the atmosphere. If they're really big, like maybe the size of a big chunk of rock or maybe the size of a small car, they'll create these gigantic fireballs. Huge, bright, even break up, create these fragments that go across the sky. If they hit the ground, we call them a meteorite. So it's a meteoroid in space, a meteor in the atmosphere, and a meteorite when it hits the ground. What's in the sky is creating the patterns. It's creating patterns that are um, uh, echoing and mirroring uh, patterns that occur on Earth. So you have these communications from Sky Camp, and it's not necessarily the heavenly bodies themselves, um, but it's the pattern and image that they're creating that creates a, a world of spirit that interacts with, you know, um, the, with this world, the tangible world down here. And there's so much, and they're not that separate either because there's so much interaction. So, you know, you could be singing up that uh, star story, sky story, and, and then, but there might be some smoke from the fire that'll go across and that enters the song, that enters the story in that moment, you know, that becomes part of that. Uh, some night birds flying across or... Um, and of course, you know, clouds, but of course, shooting stars, you know, um, these are, it's, it's constantly in motion. There's a constant exchange of uh, energy and matter between the two worlds um, and sentient entities. It's, it's a, a communication. So you have this ancestral communication, you know, between Sky Camp and where you might be standing in your subjective experience in that moment. Because colonization has been so devastating in, in Australia, it's fragmented a lot of the traditional knowledge. So different elders will have bits and pieces. Some places the elders have a lot of the knowledge. Some places they don't. I've been to communities where they say, we, we don't have hardly any of this stuff. 
and they rely on the archive, which is filled with all kinds of problems because it was written by non-indigenous people um, who didn't understand the language or the concepts and had their own bias and motivation for doing what they were doing. What I tend to do a lot of the times is go through the archive and pull all that stuff that I can, that has to be synthesized and analyzed. You know, I go and I interview the elders and the community members. So I get those fragments of knowledge from them. And then any physical sites that might relate to that. And then I try to go through all of that together and try to synthesize all that. So it's constant consultation with the elders. The archive says this, I think they're wrong. You know, and the elders will come in and say, well, this part's wrong, this part's right. And we, we come out, we converge at the end of the day with something that the community's happy with that we can then turn into books and educational materials and curricula and things like that. What I've been very privileged to learn about are some of the interesting ways that Aboriginal people across Australia understand meteors or these shooting stars. One of the common views is that they represent evil spirits or evil beings. I know this is kind of a simplification, but they're seen as these long streaks across the sky, serpentine-like uh, creatures with long arms and claws uh, go by different names. One of the famous ones is Namorodo, or Namorador. Meteors also can represent the spirits of people who have passed away. The shooting star is always a something. So a something in our way is, um, is a communication, you know, from that other world. It's a, a communication in spirit. And a shooting star is always a something. You know, like a bird landing over there, sometimes that might be a something. But sometimes it's just a bloody bird, you know. <laughs> but a shooting star is always a something. And whether or not you... Um, you know, you need to meet and discuss and look at all the signs and all of the context, but then what's happening in the community, you know, before you decide, is that a death? Is that a birth? You know, is it another uh, kind of signal? Is it an entity, um, you know, traveling between the worlds? And then where is that? What's the direction of that? What's the color of that? Uh, is it good or bad? You know, what's happening? Because we do have you know, these entities that travel between the worlds and always have. Sometimes these objects will actually hit the ground and we have a whole range of meteorite impact craters all around Australia. In fact, there's about 30, I believe, 30, 35 confirmed craters in Australia. Some of them ranging in size from no more than 25 meters wide, like Dalgaranga, to ranging in over 100 kilometers wide, like Ackerman. And what's interesting is some of these craters are discussed in Aboriginal traditions. What it tells us is there's not always exactly one clear-cut black and white version of traditions. There are multiple traditions, even about the same site, even about the same stars in the sky. There's a multitude of meanings, and multiple layers behind that. You need to move with country. You need to pay attention to the heavens as well as the earth. And there is constant communication between the worlds. There is an exchange of matter. And these are complex, dynamic, self-organizing systems uh, that are constantly interacting with each other. Um, and as self-organizing systems, they, they do have an inherent intelligence. And, um, you know, so for a culture where you might see that a rock is a sentient uh, thing that carries knowledge inherently and has pattern, has knowledge, um, then you know that every rock up there uh, has that knowledge. Is there intelligent life in the universe? Well, the universe is intelligent life. And um, yeah, when we see these meteors, they, they, are, they are that intelligence communicating with us. So it's important that we look at these traditions, that we look at the science, and we bring those two worlds together. Because there's so many ways that these can benefit each other. There's so many ways that we can find innovation. There's so many ways that we can look at these ancient traditions to help us understand the process of how these things form, to understand how long ago they formed, and to help us understand how long a world tradition lasts. Because as indigenous people have been telling us, these traditions can last very long periods of time. And we can see that even lasting thousands of years.